Wait, hang on, hang on. All the way back here. This is what they felt like when it happened. And today, it's how we should feel too. Because what it meant for them, it means for us. He's empty, he's risen. Amen, amen. amen. If you think about it in terms of of uh, having a friend, you have a friend that you're really, really close to, and he was unjustly accused. He was killed in just a horrific, horrific way. And <coughs> your hope was really he, he was he was your hope and 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 now where where is that? And then you hear, wait, wait, something's happened. And then you see him, and your friend whom you, you, you thought was gone is now back, and he is risen. And just think about what that joy is like. And that's what we have in Jesus. I invite you to stand as we sing. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon
We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah.
outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped in to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that that was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they had saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. Mercy fall on me. 
Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. God, we give you thanks for your unspeakable gift, the gift of power over death the gift of life, eternal life, abundant life, life with you. We give you thanks. What a gift. And we bring you gifts. These gifts are tokens. They are tokens, a portion of all that you have given us. But we give it to you because you are worthy, because you have invited us to give, because, dear God, we can and we give what we can, and we pray your blessing on it. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, you may be seated. church, preschool through second grade today. Amy's back in the back. You're welcome to go. Before all the children leave, I just want you to know that you should connect with me after the service. The children aren't listening. They're walking right on out. You're going to wish you did. We uh, are finishing up Job this morning, and you may think that's odd, but we, we trifle a bit with our faith. We do. What do we know? What do we really, by faith, know? What are we so certain of that we would stake our life on it and the lives of our children and the lives of everyone we love and everyone we know and everyone else? What is it that we do not now see that we are so certain of, that we can picture in our imagination so clearly, so profoundly, 
that our hearts swell and ache and spill over with longing. What image of God do we have that is so overwhelming, so enveloping, that it has the power to overcome our very worst experience? How much do we trust Him? How much do we believe that He will deliver on everything He's promised? Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead, or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives. And that in the end, He will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns with. Job chapter 19, verses 23 to 27. In my opinion, one of the most profound passages in Job. Because it expresses his deep personal faith. He wants his words recorded. He is so confident of what he's about to say that he knows it's not just important for his own sake, but for all people, for all time. Written on a scroll, inscribed in metal, engraved in stone. The Ketef Hinnom Scroll is likely the oldest manuscript portion of the Bible in existence. It's a copy of the great priestly blessing from Numbers inscribed on silver. Probably, originally, it was worn around the neck. And it dates from just before the exile, about the time of Jeremiah, It is the earliest tangible connection we have to the Old Testament writings and the culture flowing out of the words of Moses. The earliest record of God and His goodness. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace inscribed in metal. Finding a way to make something timeless, something permanent. It's an ongoing challenge for everyone. I had a friend who uh, served for many years for the conference as kind of a record keeper. Decades the man served. And when he retired, he made a project out of digitizing everything that he had done. And he took it to the Mennonite Historical Society and handed them a flash drive. He said, this is my work. And they said, where's the paper? The stone inscriptions that we have that record sections of the Bible or refer to it are, of course, even older than the Silver Scroll But Job's point is well taken. If you want a thing to last, you're going to have to be intentional about it. And he wants this to last. And last. 
and last and last. Job believes what he is saying is that important. It's timeless. It's applicable to everyone for all time. And my heart lifts when I consider his words. It's not a guess, it's not a wish, it's a certain knowledge. He proclaims this as he's sitting in the dust, scraping his sores and counting his loss and mourning his children while his brothers and his friends have left him, except for the friends and his wife who insult his faith and encourage him to despair. I know that my Redeemer lives. And wishing he could defend his innocence before God himself, absolutely sure in his heart that God would vindicate him, he proclaims that certain and powerful truth, I know that my Redeemer lives. His life is a shambles. An unreasonable unexplainable ruin with no evident end in sight death is nearly certain to him yet he is utterly convinced that God will restore him to his dignity he has a clear picture of what it will look like it will be personal and tangible and everything he's lost will be given its proper dignity and value That's what redemption is. I know that my Redeemer lives. And Job's faith, it's not an abstract. It's not an impersonal symbol. It's a force as hard as rock, as dense as lead, as real as flesh. He speaks the most personally concrete, physical terms that you can muster up. It's possible that I will die, he says, that my flesh will peel away and rotting fall to the ground. But at the same time, he's confident of a real bodily resurrection. Eyes, flesh, heart, mind, everything. He's confident that God is not a disembodied entity or a carved image or an impersonal force The image we get is of an invincible, glorious God standing on the earth in power and palpable personal essence, unseen now, but revealed then in all His majesty. And faced by Job, who will be restored and strong and able to see and fully apprehend what he is seeing, restored and glorified himself with his gaze, unaverted, justified, vindicated before the Lord of the universe, in perfect harmony, brought back after utter destruction. This is not an ethereal, unsubstantial, wispy, ghostly encounter. It is physical, tangible, completely personal, with a new reconstituted body and indestructible eyes and all the solid substance of life as we know it now and more in my flesh I will see God I myself will see him with my own eyes I and not another there is no middleman there is no filter no fear no shame no weakness There is only a man standing solid on the earth before his God, justified and whole, bathing in the glory of his presence, straight and unbroken. I know that my Redeemer lives. All along, Job has been willing to entertain the idea that he's done something wrong. Something to deserve what he got. He doesn't believe it's true, but if, if it is true, he has no idea what it could be. 
But with God as his judge, he would own it. If it could be uncovered, even so, he's certain that in his innocence or in his guilt, God will redeem him, heart, body, mind, and spirit, and make him able to stand before the Lord unflinching and whole. And after all, really, what else is there? No dread. Even if he must face death and decay, there is only glory on the other side. God standing on the earth and Job standing before him whole. And it's prophetic on a couple of levels. Job's vision was fulfilled. It wasn't exactly as he pictured it. Instead, he bowed, humbled, and silenced with his hand over his mouth. The power of God in his awful presence was too much for Job's earthly, unredeemed body. His confidence was not yet fulfilled in its entirety. But Job isn't talking about just that moment. He's looking beyond to a moment when God comes down to not just overwhelm him, but to renew him and redeem him. And it's not just Job. We know this happened because of today. Jesus came and walked the earth, lifted up the broken, redeemed the sinner, brought hope to the hopeless. Then He died to redeem everyone and rose in power over death on the earth, Lord of life, Redeemer of humanity. And you heard it read a little bit earlier. Jesus walking in and startling everyone. They thought they saw a ghost. But He says, touch me. Look, a ghost doesn't have flesh. People try to spiritualize it, symbolize it, existentialize this truth, but everything crumbles when we try to do this. One guy I spoke with said, well, of course he was a ghost. And, and I said, but, but he sat down and ate with them to demonstrate that he wasn't a ghost. And he says, well, ghosts can do things. Which deteriorates the whole integrity of Christ's character. Makes him into a deceptive charlatan. It breaks down to the point that it doesn't even matter because he's not worth pursuing if he's just a trickster. But no, Jesus lives bodily, physically, in every way. He lives. He rose from the dead, conquering death, redeeming all who will follow. And He stood on the earth, and He was seen by many with their own eyes and not another. And He will come again and stand on the earth. It's true Lord and King. And put down His enemies and lift up His own who have given him their hearts and their lives. And he will renew all things, restoring the lives and glorified bodies of his people, renewing everything that's broken, reclaiming the earth itself, and we will stand before him whole and unbroken, forgiven and free, lifted up and confident with our faith vindicated. And our eyes will see Him for who He is in all His glory. Empowered by God Himself to be a part of His eternal kingdom in His presence forever. To see His very presence and live. And really, what else is there? We talk of streets of gold and seeing our loved ones and crowns and rewards and mansions and a city built of precious stones and the river of life and the trees of life and all these things are wonderful and awesome, but all that is only the work of His hands. The thought of His mind made manifest. His power given shape by the word of His mouth. And in His glory and power and justice and holiness and love, we can and will one day bathe in His presence, bask in His glow, and be lost in His eternal essence. And after all, really, 
What else is there? And if we can bend our finite minds and muster our hope and stir our imaginations, we might just be able to gather together enough of an idea that of what it could mean to get a glimmer, the very faintest pulse of a wave to capture the longing. C.S. Lewis in The Pilgrim's Regress talks about longing, how beautiful a thing, a deep and compelling longing is, how rare it is. It comes upon us unexpectedly and washes over us like an invigorating wave that leaves a sense of powerful, deep emptiness. And then it's gone. And after that, we know what we're missing. But we do not feel it as we did when the longing was upon us and we spend our days longing for the longing. Oh, with Job, how our hearts could yearn within us. Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. According to His power that is at work within us. He is our Redeemer. And He has promised all of this to us for the merest grain, the merest speck of faith. To know that our Redeemer lives and to pursue Him, to trust Him, to stand before Him unashamed and loved and forgiven and wanted and to give ourselves to Him. And after all, what else is there? Oh God, We are here today, people of hope. People of faith that what you did is real. People who today long for, reach for, grasp, hold tightly to ourselves the hope that you have given us. Because we are broken. There are people here today who are broken bodily, emotionally, mentally, relationally, financially. Broken. If not for the hope that you give, we'd have nothing. We are here today, people of hope, who in our brokenness exert all the faith that we can muster that you are true. True in what you say, true in what you've done, and true to us as we endeavor to be true to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. And right now, right now I'm losing breath. I've been on this stage time after time, reminding the broken it'll be all right. But right now, oh, right now I just can't. It's easy to see when there's nothing to bring me down. Oh, but what will I say when I'm held to the flame like I am right now? I know you're able and I know you can save through the fire with your mighty hand. My hope is you alone They say it only takes a little faith To move a mountain Well, good thing A little faith is all I have right now God, when you Say the word, but even if you don't, my hope is you alone. You've been faithful, you've been good all of my days. Jesus, I will cling to you, come what may, because I know. I know you can. I know you're able, and I know you can save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. I know the sorrow, I know the hurt would all go away if you just say the word. you have something that you would like prayer for, the prayer team will be up here in the front corner, and they would be glad to pray with you and anoint you.
This is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his mercy, 
he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead.
Now brothers. Amen. Now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died of our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of our, the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as the, to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and I do not deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me has not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me.
God of peace, who brought back again from the dead our Lord Jesus, equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, all that is pleasing to him. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go this week rejoicing in the knowledge of our risen Lord. You're dismissed. Thank you.